So, the Parliament of the World's Religions, what an amazing week I had in Toronto. There were some 7,500 people there from every continent, from every religion you've ever heard of, and then probably 10 times as many. It was just an amazing time of being together with people who care deeply about the environment and about peace and justice and community and working together. And everybody comes to the parliament with compassion. And I felt that everywhere I went. And imagine 7,500 people fitting in a room. It was massive. And the speakers and the movies and the plays and the breakout workshops and sessions, it was just truly an amazing time. My very first day that I got there, I wanted to kind of check out the place because it was like a maze and trying to figure out how to get from one end of the conference center where one workshop may have been to get to the opposite end where the movie begins in 10 minutes, you kind of needed ahead of time to figure out how to get around. So I got there and one of the first things I saw was this amazing quilt. It was 120 feet long, which I'm guessing is longer than this whole wall. You could barely see the other end. And the lady by the name of Esther Bryan who created this quilt happened to be there and I had a chance to visit with her a little bit. But imagine a quilt that long, first of all. And it was stunning. It was like every color of the rainbow and it was done in the light spectrum. So it was just visually very, very striking. And it had something like 263 squares and Esther Bryan got this idea when she went 20 years ago, 1998, to Slovenia with her mom and dad. Now her dad had left Slovenia in Eastern Europe after World War II and hadn't been back. And he wanted to go see if he could find family and where he grew up and see if the house was still there. And so the family went and she had an amazing experience being there in this country that she had heard about from her father and actually experiencing it for herself. And she realized from this trip that every single person has a place from which they came and everyone has a story to tell about that place. And it didn't really matter in her mind what religion people happened to be or what ethnicity they were or whatever background. She just all of a sudden had this idea of this amazing quilt project where she was going to ask every single indigenous group and someone from every country that happened to be living in Canada if, we, if they could find one person that would tell their story from, whence, from where they came and create a, a square about this big. And what she did is she made this quilt out of every single one of those squares and then wrote a book where people had to, the, the opportunity to share their story. So the book is something like 300 pages and I was flipping through it and uh, almost bought it, but I was thinking about my suitcase and how it was already at the limit. Um, then I thought, well, maybe I'll get it when I, I get back home. But it was truly an amazing thing to look at this quilt and to walk the whole length of it looking at um, all the different squares. So Esther Bryan told me that every country in the world is represented on this quilt. And there's somebody from every country in the world living in Canada. And so she contacted um, the Department of Immigration and said, I need your help. I want to get a story from every single person that's here from every country in the world. And I also want to hear from every indigenous group. So if you travel throughout Canada, there are dozens and dozens of native peoples from all over that have different religious beliefs and backgrounds, and they're similar in many ways, but they had, they took up almost the entire bottom of, of the quilt, all 120 feet of it. But it was really quite amazing looking at this spectacular quilt and knowing that there was a story from each person. And also, it occurred to me that at the Parliament of the World's Religions, every single person there had a story to tell. And many of us had the opportunity to tell our stories to other people. 
And whether I went to a movie or a plenary workshop, uh, or, or the plenary session or a workshop, I constantly heard people sharing their stories of place, of spirituality, of relationships, and of how that group of people is trying to make the world a better place. Now, the reason that Esther Bryan put this quilt together was because it, she wanted it to be a vision of hope, where everybody who saw the quilt could realize that we all not only have a story to tell, but there's some sense of beauty and unity. And as you looked at the quilt, as I looked at the quilt, I was amazed at the beauty, and it represented to me, or for me, what the entire parliament was all about. And I, I could spend the next week just telling you stories that I heard and experienced there, but I'm going to tell you one in particular that really stood out for me. There's a man that spoke at the plenary session. He lives in Toronto, and his name is... I can't even say it, Abu Laish, he's from the Middle East and he grew up in a refugee camp, Izzedine Abu Laish, I think is how you say it. Anyway, he grew up his entire life in a Syrian refugee camp. His entire education, elementary school through high school, was in that refugee camp and he lived in utter poverty. But this young boy, through the encouragement of mentors, his family, and people around him, he studied hard. And when he graduated from high school, he was able to get a scholarship. And he went to Cairo in Egypt and worked on a medical doctorate degree. And then he went to the University of London and finished his MD, and then went to Harvard and got another degree from there. It was amazing having him share his story. Thinking about a young boy in a refugee camp, growing up in poverty, that had this vision because of the encouragement of the community, it, it was so stirring to me learning about him and listening to him speak. However, it was one of the saddest stories I have ever heard in my life because he decided that he was going to dedicate his life to peace and harmony and reconciliation between Israel and Palestine. It was not easy. And he wanted to tell his story, and his stories, plural, faithfully. And so one of the things that he did is he shared typically, I think, uh, by telephone, but on Israeli TV, what it's like living in a war zone. One day, when he was home with three of his daughters and his niece, an Israeli tank shelled the house, and all three, three of his daughters died in the shelling and his niece. He was in another room, and when it happened, he ran into the room, and there were body parts everywhere. He knew that they had all died, and he was devastated. He also knew a few minutes later it was time for him to do his interview on TV, and so he decided that he needed to do that. So he picked up the phone when he was supposed to, and he told his story as it was happening, basically saying, I, I, I don't know what to say. My my three daughters were just killed by a bomb. A, a tank just blew up my house. My niece is dead. His wife, by the way, had died of cancer four months earlier. And the family was still grieving that. So Dr. Abu Laish was telling his story on Israeli TV basically as it was happening. And it became a story of transformation because people in Israel were listening to what their government and their military were doing to this man who had dedicated his life to peace and health and compassion. After this horrific incident, he moved to Toronto and um, still lives there and teaches at the university there in Toronto. And he has even deepened his commitment to peace, reconciliation, health, 
and dialogue between people who disagree with each other politically and religiously. And he's been up for the Nobel Peace Prize Award, I think several times already, just because of his passion and ability to forgive and reconcile and move beyond the, the pain that I can't even imagine. Dr. Abu Laish wrote a book called I Shall Not Hate. And in the book, he shares his story about what happened on that day, the story of his life. And he's dedicated this book and its message to his three daughters that were killed on that day of the shelling. And he also started a foundation to provide scholarships to girls and young women in the Middle East, regardless of what religion they are, regardless of their ethnicity, because he believes that more educated women will make such a difference in the world. He happens to be Muslim, and he talked about how his Muslim faith is what kept him going through those very, very difficult times. It was his Muslim faith that allowed him to forgive and to seek reconciliation and to move beyond the hatred that he immediately felt. How could he not? As I think about his story, I was so deeply moved. And as I looked around the room and saw Hindus and Buddhists and Jews and Sikhs and on and on and on, I just thought, we all have stories to tell and we all have the potential to be like Dr. Abu Laish. Yesterday I was walking. Um, I had just gotten back a couple days ago from Toronto and I went for a nice long walk from Shipwreck Beach out to Mahu'ulapu, and I just happened to be walking next to some people from Canada, and one man said to me, I just don't like the fact that we have all these Muslims coming into our country because they want to change us all. And I, I was a little shocked after, you know, just getting back from the Parliament of the World's Religions going, I just came across so many people of so many different faiths, including Muslims who just put me to shame, I feel, in terms of how they're able to forgive and, and dedicate their life to what is good and what is compassionate. So anyway, I had a brief conversation with this man, and um, basically what he said, these people, they come to our country and they try to change us all. And I remember thinking as he was sharing this with me, I've met many Muslims and I've never once felt like a single one of them tried to change me, but I'll tell you what, I've come across a lot of Christians who have. <laughs> I also thought, you know, we do need reasonable, sensible immigration policies in this country, just like every country needs. Policies that are just, but they also need to be compassionate. And as I listened to Dr. Abu Laish, I thought, I'm so glad that there is a place for him in Toronto because what he offers Canada and the entire world is priceless. His story is just amazing. And yet there are people in our country who don't believe that people like him should be here because of his religion and his country of origin. Now, I know a lot of us will have many different theories and ideas of immigration, but whatever it is that we do as a country, I pray that we show compassion to people who are fleeing their lives, or fleeing their country because they just want to live. I also talked to a man, I think on that very same day, who was from Colombia, and he was telling me his story. It was just somebody I happened to be sitting next to, and he said, they kidnapped my brother because they think my family has a lot of money and we're not poor, but we're not super rich either. But we had to come up with $50,000 to get him back. That was all the money we had. And then they threatened my life. And because I worked in a bank, they figured I had access to all that money and that I could just steal the money and I wasn't going to do that. So I left the country because I knew if I stayed, they would kill me. I can't tell you how many refugees and immigrant stories I've heard just like that. And yet, 
in the news, I often hear we need to, we need to be afraid of these people. They want to come and change us. The other thing I thought is I was listening to this Canadian yesterday saying, oh, they come here and they, they want to change us. I thought, I hope Dr. Abulais will change me because I want to be more like him. I want to have the kind of compassion he has for people. I want to have that ability to forgive because I don't think I'm quite there yet. I don't think if somebody killed my son, I would be able to say, you know what? I need to dedicate my life to peace and forgiveness and reconciliation to those people who killed my son. I hope that there are people like him that change all of us, that we will be committed to peace and compassion and reconciliation and telling our stories in community regardless of the horrific things that we might have to deal with in our lives. Now, as I think of Dr. Abu Laish's story, I think I don't know too many people who've suffered emotionally like he has. But I think all of us have done a fair amount of suffering in our lives. And regardless of where we're from or what our upbringing has been or what, what we happen to believe about God, I hope and pray that we will be able to say, God has compassion for each and every person in this world, including each and every one of us, regardless of our gender, of our sexual orientation, of our religion, of our country of origin, of our political ideas. On the last night of the parliament, several of us gathered together. It had ended um, that morning or early afternoon, and um, some of us, including Kathy Evans, who many of you know, and her good friend Barbara, and they've come to church here many times, um, and a few other friends, we just went out to dinner, and it was Kathy that actually said, well, now that the parliament is over, what is the takeaway for each of us? What are we, how are we going to be changed? How are we going to go home differently? What, what are we going to do? We spent a whole week being around these amazing speakers and people who are religious leaders that have had so much to offer. And as she said that, I almost felt like, how can you even ask such a question? It's been like drinking from a fire hydrant for an entire week. How do you, how do you put all that together and say, here's what I'm going to go home and do now. I need some time to let it settle and figure it out. But a couple things came to mind. Art was a very important part of the parliament. Not only the quilt, but the many forms of art that were there. And it occurred to me that one of the things I need to do is continue to think about how my art as a watercolorist can make a difference in the world. And I don't think it was a coincidence. Yesterday, um, the Kauai chapter of the Nature Conservancy showed a film about the ohia tree. At, at the Parsonage, and it was um, a closed event, it was invitation only, and I was just hosting it. But these people from all over Kauai came and learned about the rapid ohia death that has happened on the Big Island, and how now it has come to Kauai, and there are maybe several dozen trees that are affected, and this, according to the National Tropical Botanical Gardens, this tree is the most culturally important and ecologically important tree in all of Hawaii, and it's in danger. And somebody from the Kauai chapter of the Nature Conservancy happened to come to the art gallery in the last few months, and they went back to their boss and said, this would be a really good place to show the film. And so a bunch of people showed up yesterday in the afternoon, and they showed this amazing film, and it just so happens that my last piece of art was the lehua blossom from the ohia tree. And it was just so cool to be able to share that with them and my connection with the tree and Hawaii Island. And most of the, um, the documentary took place on Hawaii Island and every place it mentioned I had been. And I just felt like what an amazing thing that just kind of fell into my lap. And so as I'm thinking about the parliament, I thought, what else can I do? So I asked the, the people from the Nature Conservancy, would, you, would it be okay if sometime in the future, hopefully by the end of the year, 
we could show this film maybe several times in an afternoon and just invite people to come? And would some of you come and speak about what you're doing and what needs to happen here on Kauai? Because there are something like 75,000 acres of dead trees on Hawaii Island. And I've seen some of those, and it's just one of the saddest things I've ever seen. And they don't know how to prevent it, but they're working on it. And I thought, okay, so art obviously is one way that I can take something from the parliament and just ramp it up, you know, do more than what I've been doing in the past. The other thing is storytelling. And I, you probably know this, I love telling stories. I love writing books. I love speaking in my sermons about other people's lives and about my life and about some of your lives. And I thought, I need to spend some time thinking about how telling stories changes lives and inviting other people that are very different from me to tell their stories and perhaps for some of you to hear some stories of people who are very different from us. I'm not quite sure where that's all going to go, but the art and the storytelling were the two things that really, really stood out for me. I'm going to warn you, this is not the last time you're going to hear about the Parliament of the World's Religions on a Sunday morning, but I do want you to think about some of the things I just shared and how there might be an art form that you can do to help people connect. And in terms of telling stories, there might be somebody that you could share your story with or somebody you just need to ask, tell me your story. You're really different from me. I want to learn about you. What's your story? Whatever it is that you decide to do in terms of art or storytelling, please do it with compassion because that's one of the things that was kind of the thread throughout all of the parliament of the world's religions. Every religion, every talk, every piece of art, every movie, compassion was there in all of it. And we are a people of compassion. Amen.